Kent Holtorf has trained numerous physicians across the country in the use of bioidentical hormones, hyperthyroidism, complex endocrine dysfunction, and innovative treatments of chronic fatigue syndrome, fibromyalgia, and chronic infectious diseases, including Lyme disease. He's the medical director of Holtorf Medical Group Affiliate Centers, the medical director of the nonprofit National Academy of Hyperthyroidism, and he was the founding medical director for Fibromyalgia and Fatigue Centers. Dr. Holtorf is a diplomat, board examiner, and fellowship lecturer for the American Board of Anti-Aging Medicine, the endocrinology expert for America Online Health, and he is the founding director of our nonprofit Bioidentical Hormone Initiative and a senior faculty member of the Bioidentical Hormone Institute. When Dr. Holtorf agreed to put together today's presentation, uh, he came forth with a tremendous amount of information that he wanted to share with the community. And after we looked at the sheer quantity of it, we realized that it was impossible to present in one 60-minute webinar format. So we've decided to arrange a part one and a part two. Today's session will be part one. As I said earlier, we'll run for an hour. And in two weeks' time, uh, we will schedule a second session, uh, same time and same place, to continue the conversation that Dr. Holtorf is starting today. So without any further ado, um, I'm going to turn over the session to Dr. Holtorf and make him the presenter so that we can see his slide deck. Dr. Holtorf. Welcome and thank you. It's all yours. Great. So you can see the screen there? Yes. Great. Okay. So what I need to talk today about emerging concepts in the diagnosis and treatment of hypothyroidism. And I'm very excited to give this talk and, and you know, the treatment, diagnosis and treatment of hypothyroidism has become very controversial. It's become a very emotional topic. And that and so many things in medicine are like that, in that it it, and that ends up not being a scientific debate, but almost just a political, emotional debate. You, know, you have, you know, standard physicians, endocrinologists, just dead set that the TSH is all you need. Uh, thyroid is very easy. That if your TSH is high, your thyroid's low. If your TSH is low, your thyroid's high. And if it's normal, it's normal. No need for treatment. And that, despite the fact that there are hundreds and hundreds of studies showing that method doesn't work for a large percentage of patients. So, I'm going to go through the, the literature on this and really show that, wow, the way that we've been taught and been majority doctors, you know, diagnosing thyroid and treating is inappropriate. And the evidence is there. And it, it's so funny is that, you know, with doctors, uh, so many, you know, once they're set in a way that they basically refuse to look at the medical literature. A nice study, uh, this was in uh, Journal Medical, American Medical Association and also New England Journal of Medicine, they found that most doctors are practicing 10 to 20 years behind what's available in the medical literature. And they found, why is that? Well, one, doctors don't read medical journals. They don't. I mean, they'll go to the conferences and all that. It's, how can you keep up with all the massive amounts of medical literature coming in, uh, down the pike every day? But they found, even more importantly, is that doctors don't, basically, once they're uh, taught something, no matter how much data you give them, they don't want to hear it. They don't tell them what they've been doing is wrong. And they have found that it takes, on average, a proven new concept. It takes, on average, 17 years to get accepted into mainstream medicine. And, um, and so, again, because they refuse to admit that you know, what they've been doing is wrong. So we're going to talk a lot about you know, evidence-based about treatment, diagnosis and treatment of hypothyroidism. And let's see. So lecture goals is the standard method of diagnosing low thyroid accurate. Or is what we're doing correct? Are there better ways of assessing thyroid activity? And also, is the standard method that we use to treat, or most doctors use to treat, is that adequate? So by the end of these two sessions, you should um, have a very good idea of the answers to these questions. So we'll talk about the importance of local control of cellular thyroid levels, um, including diadonase activity and cellular thyroid transport. No one talks about transport. And we'll get into this, and that's actually the rate-limiting step in the activation of a cell via thyroid hormone. Talk about limitations of TSH and other thyroid function tests, the diagnostic and clinical importance of reverse T3, talk the benefits of replacement of T4-T3 combinations and straight T3, 
the benefits of compounded versus uh, standard medications, and especially in uh, T3 treatment of depression, chronic fatigue syndrome, fibromyalgia, obesity, and insulin resistance. So thyroid hormone, just a quick background, which um, everyone uh, basically knows, but just to review, it's a metabolic hormone that regulates metabolism, temperature, immunity, and cellular function. So it's really the gas pedal for the body. Every cell in the body has thyroid receptor. It regulates oxygen utilization, which goes along with metabolism, increases fat breakdown, improves cerebral function, prevents cardiovascular disease, prevents cancer, provides energy, and regulates growth and development. So what are the required steps for cellular thyroid activity? Well, first you have to have hypothalamic pituitary function. So it has to be able to function to secrete TSH, so number one. But it also has to secrete a bioactive TSH. And we'll look at this, is that a number of people, a number of conditions, including uh, secondary and tertiary hypothyroidism and primary, actually secrete a less bioactive TSH. So for the same level of TSH, you have lower T4 and T3 levels. And this is, there's a number of studies done in research model, um, and I've been uh, working on trying to work with researchers to bring this bioactive TSH assay to the market where it uh, can be used for clinical, um, uh, you know, clinical evaluation. Uh, then you need thyroid function, secretion of T4. Then you also need conversion of T4 to T3. Then you need the thyroid has to be transported into the cell, um, which all also can transfer in the cell to most of the, the conversions done inside the cell, the T4, T3. It also has to bind the receptor. Then you have to have downstream activation. Um, basically, it has to. Uh, it, cause the cascade of events to which causes the activation of all the uh, proteins and that which cause the effect after the thyroid binds. And all these have dysfunctions. And, and we ask, well, how common are, are all these dysfunctions? And you'll hear, well, they're all very uncommon except for the lack of thyroid secretion of T4. But actually, we'll go through the studies that that's probably the, the uh, least likely, the, the least prevalent problem. And the other problems are actually a much, a much bigger problem and in a higher percentage of patients. But no one's looking at them. And if you don't look at them, of course, you're not going to find them. And you know, especially you, know, you go to the endocrinology uh, meetings and the societies say, oh, you know, secondary tertiary hypothyroidism, oh, it's very rare. Or a thyroid resistance, it's very rare. It's just a genetic disorder that you know, a very small percentage of people that have. That's absolutely false. And we'll look at the studies showing that. So, and also a conversion problem. Oh, everyone converts it. It's, it's no problem. Give T4 because the body knows what to do with it. Well, that's shown not to be the case. And so we're going to go through all, all those studies and looking at that so you can be comfortable when saying that, hey, okay, TSH, it's a, something to look at. You know, labs are used as a piece of information. And, and say, okay, uh, we'll, we'll, look at, we'll look at the patient. You know, we get a panel of, of thyroid tests. And we'll, uh, most in the second half, we'll talk about what are some better tests to do. But and say, well, okay, it's a, it, there's, all labs have limitations. And so the TSH, if it's high, you know your thyroid's low because the pituitary always gets the most thyroid, which we'll talk about. But if it's normal, you don't know. So you need to look at other things. So we'll talk about uh, just a couple cases. Um, a 42-year-old woman comes in complaining of inability to lose weight, ongoing depression. She's on antidepressants, has fatigue and muscle pain. She's been diagnosed with fibromyalgia, bipolar depression, and type 2 diabetes. She's on metformin and Effexor and Vicodin for pain and also on Lipitor. She's tried numerous antidepressants and Lyrica without benefit. She brings a lab showing a TSH of 1.2, free T4 on the high end of 1.7, and a free T3 of 2.7. Okay, so what's the chance that this patient has low thyroid levels contributing to her symptoms? And a standard answer, well, thyroid test look normal. But we'll see. By the end of this lecture, you should say, wow, it's probably 90 plus percent. And that's a very common patient that you, that you see with all, with, you know, basically that, that clinical scenario. And also, what can be done to further evaluate her thyroid function? And that will be mostly in the second half. So another case, 35-year-old female with five-year history of hypothyroidism, has been on Synthroid uh, 100 micrograms for many years. She calls her office and said, what's the best type of thyroid replacement? What do you tell her? What if she feels great? Does that make a difference? What if she's depressed? Does that change your answer? What if she has diabetes? 
Does that change anything? Or she's obese? Or has chronic disease and fibromyalgia? Um, and so all those questions will, will, will be answered, I hope, um, by the end of this uh, two-part um, webinar. So symptoms of low thyroid, uh, wide-ranging symptoms, fatigue, depression, weight gain, difficulty losing weight in uh, cold extremities. And it's interesting, you know, patients will come in to a doctor and just have textbook case of low thyroid. And doctors, they don't listen, they say blah, 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 it's all they hear, and then they you know, GSH is fine, oh, you're just getting older, oh, you're just depressed, here's an antidepressant. And, and it's crazy. You know, we're, we are told in medical school, it's, you know, pounded into us, treat the patient, not the blood work. But, you know, if you go and do that out after, then, you know, people will criticize you. But, so, you know, again, doesn't mean don't get labs, and we're going to show how to really better evaluate a patient's um, uh, thyroid activity. Constipation, dry and coarse skin, cold intolerance, hair loss or dry hair. So typically hair loss all over, more dry, more brittle. If you have typical hair loss just on top of the head, think low estrogen. If you have the male pattern, think you know, high DHT. But you can also have a combination of those. Poor memory, poor concentration, anxiety, lack of sweating, weakness, pale skin. Um, you know, thyroid dilates the vessel. So when, you, when you're low thyroid, you, people look, look pale shortness of breath, PMS, and we'll look at a number of studies showing that the large majority of people with PMS have low thyroid. And you treat them with thyroid, they get better. And although their TSH looks normal. Heavy menstrual flow, muscle joint aches, poor motivation, water retention, migraines, infertility. So all those things, when you, when you see those, think um, low thyroid. People say, well, I only have fatigue or I only have depression. And when we get into this, you'll see that there's the significant local control of thyroid. And every cell needs different amounts, every tissue. So, and also there's genetic components. So some patients will just have fatigue. Other ones will just have depression. Other ones will inability to lose weight. Other ones will have everything. So it depends on um, you know, what tissue is getting what. And that can also change uh, over time. It can change with different physiologic conditions. It certainly changes with different types of thyroid preparations. So a we'll review here on thyroid physiology. Um, hypothalamus, I don't know if you can see my pointer or not. Um, hypothalamus uh, produces thyroid, uh, thyrotropin releasing hormone, tells the pituitary to secrete TSH, and uh, then, um, then this, it stimulates the thyroid to secrete T4. And T4 is not active, it doesn't do anything. You hope it goes to T3, but it can also go to reverse T3, which actually blocks the thyroid. Um, so we'll, we'll talk more about that. So the standard way, of course, to diagnose low thyroid is based on an elevation of TSH above 4.2 to 5.7, depending on the lab. Now, there's some now push to bring that down to um, 2, 2.5, 3.5, depending on what study you look at. But again, it's, that's better, but as we look, we'll show that TSH is probably the pituitary, it really all it indicates is what's going on in the pituitary. And the pituitary is a totally unique tissue and it's often opposite of what the other tissue is occurring in other tissues. When thyroid levels drop in the other tissues, it goes up in the pituitary. So it's probably almost the worst tissue to, to really uh, be able to evaluate the uh, thyroid status of the body. And we'll miss over 80% of people with low thyroid, especially if they have diabetes, chronic fatigue syndrome, any inflammation, chronic stress, depression. Um, we're going to go through all those and can complain of numerous symptoms of low thyroid, but 90% of doctors won't treat because they have a normal TSH, saying your thyroid's fine. You know, here's, go, you know, go diet more, you know, take an antidepressant, whatever it may be. So deionases, what, are they, what do they do? They convert T4 to T3 or T4 to reverse T3. So again, reverse T3 is a mirror image of T3. So it basically, uh, T3 goes to receptor, stimulates you have energy, metabolism, cell activation. Reverse T3 goes there, nothing happens. So we'll say, well, it's just an inactive metabolite. But no, it's like a false key stuck in that lock, so it actually lowers um, thyroid activity. It's, a, it's a, um, uh, basically an antagonist of thyroid, competitive inhibitor. It also shown to reduce T4, T3 um, um, conversion and reduces uptake of T4 and T3 into the cell. So it, is, it has significant activity and is not just an inactive metabolite. 
there are different deionates in different tissues. And one key thing is the pituitary is totally different than every other tissue in the body. So the pituitary acts differently than every other tissue. And again, they'll, they'll change in response to physiologic conditions. And uh, this local control is independent of serum levels. So here's a diagram here. And you look at the left here is the pituitary cell. So the pituitary has type 2 deionase. And the, what type 2 deionase does is convert T4 to T3. Okay. Now, the right-hand side is the rest of the body. It has two types of deionases, type 1, which converts T4 to T3, and type 3, which converts T4 to reverse T3. Now, the pituitary does not have any type 3 deionase, so it doesn't make reverse T3. And these deionases are very different, the type 1 and type 2, uh, between the pituitary and the rest of the body, in that while they both convert T4 to T3, their, their activity is stimulated and suppressed in opposite directions. So if you have diabetes, depression, dieting, inflammation, stress, obesity, PMS, leptin resistance, aging, autoimmune disease, insulin resistance, fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue syndrome. All of these are shown to stimulate type 2 deionase. Okay, so you get more T4 to T3 conversion in the pituitary. So now the pituitary has higher levels, but it suppresses type 1 deionase in the rest of the body. So now you have low T3 levels in the rest of the body, and it also stimulates type 3 deionase. So you have high reverse T3 in the rest of the body, which is blocking the thyroid. So the cells in the body are now hypothyroid, and the pituitary is actually a little bit hyper. It sees more. And, and again, so it's a completely opposite effect, and where the TSH drops, but the rest of the body is hypothyroid. And here's when you look at kind of blood tests, you know, what do blood tests look like as you get severity of illness, depression, calorie restriction, um, and you go out on the curve there and you look at what happens with, with all these levels. Reverse T3 goes up. You can see the normal ranges there in the, the uh, dotted line. 3T4 actually goes up a little bit and then starts dropping. Now this is because you get, again, we'll talk more when we get into transport, but the transporter for T4 is much more energy dependent than the transporter for T3. So as you get sick or stressed or have inflammation, the body will not basically uptake T4 to the cells. So what happens, T4 goes up, okay? And so it looks like, wow, it's higher, that's good. Well, it's actually lower inside the cell. The, the TSH will go up a little bit, but then it will start declining. Um, and so as you get sicker, again, you get more stimulation of that type 2 deionase. So the T3 in the pituitary is going up as the rest of the body, uh, the thyroid levels, the T3 levels are going down. Now the free T3 will continually drop. But you look at people are hypothyroid, even you know, in, the, in the middle range here, they're significantly low thyroid, and the TSH does not indicate until they're all until very, very sick, until they're very hypothyroid. Free T3, a little better marker. It has a little better correlation. But when you look at what's the best method to use, you look at the ratio of free T3 to reverse T3, will tell you that is the best marker for tissue level of, of hypothyroidism. Now, the TSH is accurate if a person has no stress, no illness, is not overweight, has no inflammation, um, basically is laying on the beach with no worries. So other than that, the TSH becomes unreliable. And again, we're going to, we're going to uh, go through those studies to prove that point. So, but really this, this shows that you know, the sicker you are, the less reliable the TSH is. The older you are, the more depressed, the more you're dieting. Chronic dieting, actually uh, shown to suppress TSH, increase reverse T3, lower metabolism. Um, and when you go back to normal eating, it doesn't go back to normal. And so as the sicker you are, the more inaccurate TSH and T4 levels are and a diminished, uh, diminished utilization of T4, which shows also if you're sick, don't use T4 because it's not going to work. So why is the TSH unreliable? Um, let's consider the most sensitive marker for tissue levels of thyroid. And it's simple, and you know we all like simple tests, but the problem is if a simple test isn't working, you've got to do something else. Um, 
But again, it's only a marker for the pituitary level of T3. Numerous conditions result in increased pituitary T3 levels, um, and TSH will miss it 20 to 90 percent of the time. Okay, and uh, references there. The re um, if if there's just a few references on the slide, I'll list them. But if there's a lot, um, those are available at the National Academy of Hypothyroidism, nahypothyroidism.org, and they're all available there. On um, this is the initial. There's an article on is TSH accurate. There's one on deiodinases one on thyroid transport. So you can look at those. If it, if it just lists the number, then that's where you'd find those. And we should be able to post those as well on BHI. So such conditions, including physiologic stress, 32 references there showing that if you have physiologic stress, TSH is not reliable. Depression, insulin resistance and diabetes, aging, calorie deprivation or dieting, inflammation, PMS, chronic fatigue fibromyalgia, obesity, and numerous other conditions. So with all those conditions, the TSH is not reliable. So all these conditions are shown to have secondary or tertiary hypothyroidism. So, you know, again, primary is really the only one that is detected with standard blood tests, so looking for a high TSH. But with secondary, meaning from the pituitary, or tertiary, meaning hypothalamic dysfunction, it doesn't pick it up. The TSH looks normal and will only be picked up when the free T3 or T3 and T4 levels basically get so low that now they become abnormal. Otherwise, they go, oh, you're fine. You know, the patient has every symptom in the book, but they say, oh, you're fine. And all these conditions are shown to be associated with tertiary and secondary hypothyroidism. They also have reduced thyroid cellular transport, which is a very exciting field and a key, uh, key component to being able to really understand the diagnosis and treatment of hypothyroidism, and we'll, we'll get to that um, a little later. Again, all these, um, all these conditions cause low tissue thyroid levels that aren't detected by the TSH. So let's look at a couple studies on the accuracy of TSH. The study published in British Medical Journal, 49 patients with primary hypothyroidism. They investigated the correlation of TSH, free T4, and T3 with the level of tissue hypothyroidism. They found very poor correlation with TSH, better correlation with free T4 and free T3. So they state, TSH is a poor measure for estimating the clinical and metabolic severity of primary overt thyroid failure. In contrast to good correlations with both circulating thyroid hormones, we found no correlation, only weak correlation with serum TSH. In British Medical Journal. And we found no correlation between the different parameters of target tissue and serum TSH. So they're looking at tissue levels of thyroid, tissue activity. Therefore, the biological effects of thyroid hormones at the peripheral tissue and not TSH concentration reflect the clinical severity of hypothyroidism. A judicial initiation of thyroxin treatment should be guided by clinical and metabolic presentation and thyroid hormone concentrations and not by serum TSH. So I totally agree with that. Maybe not with the T4. You should do other preparations. But these are major medical journals saying this. A study published in the Journal of Rheumatology looked at the accuracy of using a TSH to determine whether a person is hypothyroid uh, in fibromyalgia patients. So using TRH testing, um, thyrotropin releasing hormone, so basically what they do is inject that hormone and look at the TSH and uh, T4 and T3 response, which is more of a gold, certainly a gold standard for the measure of thyroid function. They found that all of the patients with fibromyalgia were hypothyroid, despite the fact that the standard blood tests, including TSH, T4, and T3, were in the normal range. So again, all of them. They found that these patients tended to have a low normal TSH that averaged 0.86 versus 1.42 in normals, with a high normal free T4 and a low normal T3. So you know, basically, the, most doctors will check a TSH and maybe a free T4 and say, oh, this patient's on the high end of thyroid which is completely the opposite. It's totally wrong. And you'll understand that when we get into thyroid transport. So these patients, again, have a secondary and have a number of, uh, of physiologic abnormalities going on, including the um, secondary tertiary hypothyroidism. So the TSH is lower. They have poor thyroid transport, so T4 goes up. They have poor T4 to T3 conversion. They have high reverse T3. So all these things, these patients are hypothyroid. But because their TSH is low normal and they're free T4 is high normal, they're told, oh, your thyroid's a little high, and it's fine. Same exact thing occurs with depression, and we'll get into that. 
So with fibromyalgia patient, baseline blood tests shown to be normal range, um, but have a significant reduction in TSH and thyroid hormone secretion in response to TRH. So again, unless you're doing TRH tests on patients, you're not going to detect it. And interestingly, TRH is not available. <laughs> so what do you do? And we'll talk more about that in the second half. So you cannot say a chronic fatigue syndrome or fibromyalgia patient is euthyroid based on blood tests. And again, this journal of rheumatology. And here's the, um, the study there. So study published in Lancet. It's another study that um, they basically took patients who were just fatigued, and they did thyroid biopsies on them. And they found that 40% of the patients actually had lymphocytic thyroiditis. But only 40% of those were positive for TPO or antithyroglobin antibodies or had an abnormal TSH. So the thyroid dysfunction would go undetected in the majority of these patients unless you go around biopsying everyone's thyroid. And even maybe more interesting is that they, they gave everyone thyroid. And they found that they all responded. didn't matter what their TSH was. Again, because the TSH is a very poor marker. The author state, after treatment with thyroxine, clinical response was favorable, irrespective of baseline TSH concentration. A study published in New England Journal of Medicine investigated the incidence of hypothyroidism in women who were premenstrual with PMS, using, again, TRH testing and iodine uptake scans, as well as measuring TSH, T4, T3, T3 uptake, and thyroid antibodies. They found that 94% of patients with PMS had thyroid dysfunction, again, tissue hypothyroidism, compared to 0% of asymptomatic patients. 65% of hypothyroid patients had thyroid tests in the normal range. It could only be diagnosed with TRH testing. So again, the, st uh, you know, the standard tests were missing 65% of people with low thyroid. And they found that in this study, in the New England Journal of Medicine, all the patients had complete resolution of their PMS symptoms with thyroid treatment, even though their standard blood tests were normal. Study published in the American Journal of Psychiatry, also investigated thyroid function women with PMS. Again, they used a TRH test. Study found 70% of women with PMS uh, uh, had abnormal TRH testing. Again, showing uh, the majority of people have thyroid dysfunction. Uh, obesity, let's look at. You know, all the obese people say, oh, I think it's my thyroid. And the doctors, oh, you're just lazy, stop making excuses. Well, is that true? We'll find that the overwhelming majority of time, obese patients have low thyroid. And if you look at the right test, um, then you're going to find it. You know, it's, it's inappropriate to give thyroid for weight loss, but it's certainly not inappropriate to give thyroid for hypothyroid patients who are obese. A study in the Journal of Endocrinology Metabolism, okay, the endocrine journal, examined the accuracy of using TSH to identify hypothyroid obese patients via TSH testing, I mean, uh, sorry, TRH testing. The study found that while TSH levels were not significantly different between normal weight and obese individuals, 36% of patients had severe thyroid dysfunction that was not detected by standard TSH testing. And that's severe, not just, you know, they didn't include mild or moderate. And again, this is the endocrinologist journal, and they're not reading it. So here is um, another study, International Journal of Obesity, TSH response to TRH in obesity. Again, they found no significant difference between basal serum TSH concentration and subjects and controls. Obese patients, however, had a significantly greater serum TSH concentration at 20 and 60 minutes following TRH stimulation. So again, the TSH went high, um, showing that they were hypothyroid. And here is uh, basically the TRH test um, in obese versus uh, obese at the top there and non-obese patients, showing that they're all hypothyroid. Well, here's a little clip on obesity and thyroid that I thought can kind of convey um, a little bit. I think it's just a two-minute, um, so I'll let you watch that. Well, we know healthcare is a really hot topic, and for a lot of people, there's some confusion about obesity and how much it really costs the U.S. economy. Yeah, according to a new report, that cost is over $200 billion. Here to tell us more about this, Dr. Kent Holtorp, he's a specialist with hypo
But studies are showing that's not the whole story. That there's new research showing that there's oftentimes, maybe the overwhelming majority of times, metabolic abnormalities that are causing a person to make it very difficult to lose weight uh, or, or hard to uh, enable to uh, lose weight. So these include leptin resistance or low thyroid that's not detected by standard blood tests. So when you look at these uh, abnormalities and fix these, now people who couldn't lose weight before are now able to. So we talked about the expense. We know that it costs more in health care, but also people don't go to work, they're sick, productivity falls. It really can affect the whole economy when we're talking about obesity. It really can. I mean, the study that said $215 billion, they added in fuel costs and uh, in, in working with what, what 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 the fuel costs. Like higher, if someone weighs more, so it can take more gas on an airplane. Oh, so okay. I think it's a stretch. And that you can have a child in the same thing. Right. But there really is increased health care costs of you know, uh, the diabetes and heart disease and all those things. But again, the nice thing is, is looking deeper, we can find the cause of those over the majority of time. And it's not just the diet and exercise. It's really, it's really failing. Because when we focus on that, you know, people go and they diet and exercise, then it doesn't work, and they gain weight back, they just give up. And because they're finding, interesting study is that they found that people who have yo-yo dieting or significant diet in the past, they have 25% lower metabolism. So same body size, same age, same body fat, 25% lower calories they burn per day. So 500 calories, they have to burn more or eat less just to maintain their weight. So you wonder why we just keep gaining weight. So it's that it's also that uh, diet and exercise that's the problem. So do you recommend people with a chronic weight problem to go to a doctor and talk about maybe digging deeper, like you were talking about, more tests? That really is the key. And, you know, doctors are, the, you know, they keep saying, oh, just more diet and exercise, just, you know, you've got to just suck it up. But they're not looking deep enough. They're looking at leptin levels. So if you have a leptin level above 12, you have leptin resistance. So what is leptin real quick? Leptin goes up when you gain weight. Tell the brain to stop storing energy. When this was discovered about 25 years ago, they had leptin the rats, they all lost weight. But they gave it to humans, it doesn't work. So we're finding the majority of humans that have a hard time losing weight at a leptin resistance. So the brain thinks the body's starving all the time. So it uh, lowers metabolism, increases appetite. Anytime you eat, try to store that fat. So fixing that leptin resistance, what we can do now, we can do it, uh, can all oftentimes result in a sleep at weight loss. So we go to our doctor, we ask to have our thyroid checked. It's and that's more, that's more leptin level and also reverse T3 level. We're finding, too, is that with this chronic yo-yo dieting, the body tries to lower metabolism by increasing a substance called reverse T3, which blocks the thyroid, so lowers metabolism. And even going back to normal eating, the levels don't uh, return to normal. So even you have this hypometabolism, it's very difficult to lose weight until you fix those problems. So when you find a doctor that's going to look at those, especially those two issues. Some of, this, some of the problem that America has uh, is, though, related to just that we're eating. What, what are some of the unhealthy habits we have? It, it really is. I mean, that's, it's all, it's all a real big picture. That's part of it. But again, um, and, and, but fixing it to fix those other abnormalities to really have uh, opportunity for success. But we're finding, you know, I think a lot of the processed foods are a problem. High fructose corn syrup is, is an issue. Um, there's a big lobby. I'll probably get some calls after that. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, and I think really food choices are, are important. And exercise. Studies are finding that too much exercise is not better. It lowers metabolism, especially in women. If you body senses too much stress, this um, uh, over-exercising, metabolism drops. So now you're fighting yourself. So um, again, more is not better. And do you think this is going to continue unless we get control of this problem? There's going to be more and more obese people as time goes on. That's already happening. I think it's really true, again, because we just keep going. You know, the new diet, the new fad diet, right. and more exercise, it's not working. Why is that? We need to look deeper, and the new studies are showing that there is something else going on, and that it can be fixed. A lot of great new research going on as well, but there are some things you can do today. And what are some of the basics that we can do? And again, go to the doctor, get that leptin level checked, that reverse T3 level checked, and other, other things as well. Sleep. Sleep is very important. If you don't sleep, very difficult to lose weight. The body tries to store fat. Stress is a big producer of, of weight. You know, lower stress, much easier said than done. Uh, but uh, all those things, you're almost better off with sleep, sleeping in, than waking up early and exercising. Uh, I love that story. <laughs> so, um, and all these, you know, the dogma that we've been thinking is, you know, eat less, more exercise, not working, and there's a reason for that when you look at the physiology of it. All right, so you say talk to your doctor, find out what's going on. That's it. Right. Thank you. Great, thank good. you. For more information on Dr. Holtorf, you can go to our website at Skate Okay. Um, I thought it was a good kind of overview, and I, I did get a lot of calls from the high fructose corn syrup um, lobby <laughs> before before I made it home. Um, 
But uh, yeah, so we'll, we'll keep going here. In terms of beyond statin drugs, artificially lowers TSH. And um, it's a study here in the journal Thyroid. Um, so chronic non-thyroidal illness. So and there's a lot of terms for these, um, uh, you know, uh, they're basically things that uh, all the physiology that, that's occurring. And so studies show that with any sickness, inflammation, physiologic stress, again, there's decrease in TSH, T4, T3, and increase in reverse T3. And we talked about mechanisms for that, where you get suppression and downregulation of type 1 deiodinase, so that's in the tissues of the body, uh, and activation of type 2, which increases the pituitary T4 to T3 conversion. Um, and then, uh, so that lowers TSH, and then you also get increase in type 3, which increase reverse T3 everywhere in the body except the pituitary. The more severe the stress, the more severe the suppression. And again, shown to occur with emotional stress, depression, dieting, weight gain, leptin resistance, insulin resistance, obesity, diabetes, inflammation, autoimmune disease, systemic illness, chronic fatigue syndrome, um, chronic pain, exposure to toxins, which we're going to talk about, and, and plastics. And the presence of these conditions reduce levels in every tissue except the pituitary. And so, again, going back to this, again, with all these conditions, this is what really non, so-called non-thyroidal illness is happening. And it's not a thyroid problem. It's the, with the body is not stimulating the thyroid. It's not converting T4 to T3. It's not transporting the cell. And say, well, because it's not a thyroid problem, don't treat it. Well, that's, that's ridiculous. The, the cells are hypothyroid. So, and you'll hear that when you're non-thyroidal illness, people think of, okay, people go in the hospital and they get non-thyroidal illness when they have surgery and they say, well, don't treat it. Well, it may be true because it's temporary, but if it goes on for a long period of time, uh, studies are showing it's significantly beneficial to treat. And, and this is, and uh, you'll hear that, oh, the body's doing that to, to conserve energy and so it's a beneficial thing. It's trying to be the opposite. It's, it's, it's a detrimental response the overwhelming majority of time. For instance, here is just basically looking at you know, mortality in people with non thyroid illness. The, the lower the, the T3, the, more, the higher the mortality. Um, also looking at, let's just look at simple things. Let's look at someone's the C-reactive protein. And you see there at the bottom, 0.4 to 2. And that's well within the normal range. And say, you know, below 2 is uh, you know, pretty good, below 1. Uh, ideal, but they would say you know, below 3 is normal. Now look at the free T3 in correlation with your CRP. So direct drop um, uh, in relation to even within the normal range, uh, you'll get suppression of uh, free T3 levels. Uh, another study here, German and cardiac metabolism, showing the same thing. Also here to the right, you sh it shows that even CRP going from you know, uh, 0 to 2 significant reduction in T3 to T4 ratio. So you get less conversion um, and less active T3. And also say that treatment's not beneficial, and which is true to some extent if you're talking about T4, because you're not treating with the correct hormone. It's because it's not converting T4. It's so why would you treat with T4 when that's the, one of the major problems, doesn't convert T4 to T3, you wouldn't expect it to help. So when you just understand the, the physiology, say, well, yeah, duh, you know, it, it, it doesn't work. So you've got to treat, you know, based on the abnormal physiology. So, you know, studies here, um, uh, and you can look again at um, anyhypothyroidism.org um, for the references there. But when you use T3, consistent beneficial effects are seen, especially when chronic in nature. So the body, it is not a beneficial response and lowering um, uh, the thyroid. So, you know, chronic dieting lowers your T3. Is that a beneficial response? Absolutely not. Uh, and with inflammation, is that a chronic, uh, is that a beneficial response? No. And now here's even, you know, with standard non-thyroidal illness, here's a review in uh, critical care clinics saying it should be treated. And the, the, really there's a push to change the name from non-thyroidal illness to mild thyroid failure, which, you know, that's, a, that's not a great term either. But here's uh, Leslie DeGroote saying it should be treated. And, and again, so think of also, you have all these different aspects where, where there can be abnormalities. And so, you know, T4, we'll talk more about reverse T3 and kind of remember that. So it's thought, you'll hear that it's an inactive metabolite. 
um, but it's clearly demonstrated to be competitive inhibitor of T3, blocks T3 at the receptor, references there. And a doctor called me from Colorado, said, I'm trying to get the bottom of this reverse T3, and, um, and he had a little uh, chat with the head of a major university endocrinology department. And he says there's no studies on reverse T3. It has, you know, no, it should not be tested. You know, so I sent him 50 studies and said, well, what are these then? You know, it's, uh, they just, you know, don't want to know. Suppresses T4, T3 conversion, and all the studies showing that. Reduces cellular energy production. You infuse reverse T3 into someone, their metabolism is going to drop significantly. And the study here showed that it was a more potent inhibitor of T4 to T3 conversion than PTU. So, you know what, of course, we use for treating um, hyperthyroidism. It also blocks the uptake of uh, T3 by 34% and T4 by 23% into the cell. So if you have high reverse T3, the T4 that you give or is in the serum doesn't basically 34% or excuse me, 23% less will go into the cell and 34% less T3 will go into the cell. So it also shows that serum levels are not accurate if you have high, high reverse T3. And when you have someone with high reverse T3 and let's say high T3, you'll find that they can have symptoms of high and low because again, reverse T3 is going to block it at a number of tissues, some tissues more than others. And so if, and if someone has high reverse T3, you need to get that down so they have optimal T3 effect. So here's a study here saying our results indicate that reverse T3 itself has adverse biological effects. And here is, again, a TRH stimulation test, an individual with high reverse T3. Um, you basically see the control group um, uh, here on the top and the ones with high reverse T3 on the bottom. It basically suppresses the um, uh, thyroid function. Increased reverse T3 and CFS in patients with Alzheimer's. And this is, again, Journal of Endocrine Metabolism. These results suggest that intracerebral thyroid hormone metabolism po uh, possibly the occurrence of brain hypothyroidism as a cofactor in the progression of the, of the disease. Uh, weight gain. T3 falls during acute and chronic calorie restriction, while reverse T3 increases and so the body tries to go back. It senses that stress. It's like, oh my gosh, I need to gain the weight back. Increase the reverse T3. Um, tries to gain the weight back. And even going back to normal eating, it doesn't go back to normal. So people say, I've wrecked my metabolism. They have. And unless you address it and fix that problem, their chance of success long term uh, with, with weight loss is, is very low. So again, acute and chronic dieting uh, resulted in a significant decrease in intracellular and circulating T3 levels by up to 50% and drops the basal metabolic rate by 15 to 40%. Again, all the references there. Uh, chronic dieting, the thyroid level, again, do not return to normal. Uh, so a study here in the American Journal of Physiology, uh, Physiology, Endocrinology, and Metabolism found that 25 days of calorie restriction, so they dieted for 25 days, significantly reduced the type 1 deuteronase, again, so that's in the cells of the body, resulting in reduced T4, T2 conversion by 50%. And, but it was associated with an increase in type 2, again, in the pituitary. So that totally compensated, so there was no increase in TSH, but rather it decreased because of the higher T3 in the pituitary from 1.2 to 0.7. So again, despite the fact the rest of the body had 50% lower T3, the TSH dropped from 1.2 to 0.7. So in any chronically dieting person, you can't use the TSH. Another study in American Journal of Physiologic and Chronic Metabolism found that they were decreased by 25% in chronically dieting individuals. And this study, you know, as I mentioned in the um, uh, news piece that individuals who lost weight in the past had yo-yo dieted, they, they broke them into two groups, the so same, same age, same body fat, same lean muscle, everything, but those who had dieted in the past had uh, yo-yo dieted, lost weight, um, they had 25% lower metabolism. So they, um, basically they, their metabolism was equal to someone who weighed 60% less than they did. So it was shown to be years later even. So it didn't go back to normal. 
So again, it equates to 50 to 600, uh, 500 to 600 calories a day. And so either jog for an hour and a half to make up for it, eat 500 or 600 calories less and be starving, or fix the thyroid. So it really, just 500 or 600 calories a day is about a pound a week. Um, interesting study here, they had rats, they basically fed them, dieted, you know, kind of the cycles of weight loss and weight regain in rats. And they found even after the second cycle, weight loss occurred at half the rate and the weight regain occurred at three times the rate. So severe physiologic changes were associated with the cycling effect. At the end of the experiment, cycled animals had a fourfold increase in food efficiency. So basically they, were, they could uh, basically incorporate food into fat four times better than a rat who didn't go through these cycles. Um, and really shows the possibility of metabolic and health consequences of yo-yo dieting are discussed. And that's what you see in our whole society, yo-yo dieting, the new fad diet of the month, um, and there are, everyone's wrecking their metabolism. You're wondering why everyone's just getting bigger and bigger. Let's talk about diabetes. Show that numerous studies that insulin resistance, diabetes, and metabolic syndrome associated with significant reduction, again, in T4, T3 conversion, um, and increased reverse T3, and all the, um, all the references there. Again, the elevated insulin itself will increase type 2 deiodinase that suppresses TSH levels. And again, further, which will lower T4 and T3 levels. And so with diabetes, they're all low thyroid, and, but their TSH does not detect it. So this study here in, again, Journal of Clinical Endocrine Metabolism, um, the endocrinologist's favorite journal, um, uh, found that diabetic individuals, a 42% reduction in T4 to T3 conversion. And the improvement, glucose improvement, really had really uh, very little um, improvement in the T4 to T3 conversion. So it's not just fixing the glucose. Uh, it's an inherent in insulin resistance. Another study here, 50 diabetic patients compared to 50 non-diabetics, no difference in TSH and T4. Um, but the diabetic individual had a, a decreased free T3 levels that averaged 46% less than controls. Their free T3, free, T3, uh, free T4 ratio is 50% less. So again, the TSH failed to um, uh, determine their, that they were hypothyroid, uh, despite the fact they had very low levels of T3 in the cell. Um, and again, increase in uh, another study there found exactly the same thing. So here is, um, uh, there's a study there basically showing no difference in T4 and TSH, although dramatic reduction in um, intracellular T3. International Journal of Obesity published results investigation impact of supplemental T3 on cardiovascular risk in obese patients. Okay, now they state, and again this is International Journal of Obesity, that hey, we're going to partially um, replace the low T3 that's seen in obese patients and see what happens. So 70 obese patients with normal standard thyroid tests were treated with 20 micrograms of straight T3 for six weeks. While they state the dose was not high enough to completely reverse the reduced T4 T3 conversion seen with obesity, there was a significant reduction in the number of cardiovascular risk factors, including cholesterol and markers for insulin resistance. No side effects. They state T3 may be considered to ameliorate some of the risk factors associated with abdominal obesity, particularly in some subgroups of Obese women, the relative resistance of thyroid hormone possibly dependent on decreased peripheral deiodination of T4. Um, large study in 2000 Annals Internal Medicine demonstrated those with low normal thyroid levels. So it's about heart disease, and it's a major study. They found low normal thyroid levels, the increased risk for atherosclerosis 1.7 to 1.9 times normal, the risk for heart attack 2.3 to 3.1. The author states, in conclusion, we found that subclinical hypothyroidism is highly prevalent in elderly women and is strongly independently associated with aortic atherosclerosis myocardial infarction. The author states that it demonstrated that low thyroid levels contribute to 60% of heart attacks, and they found that low thyroid levels are more of a risk factor for heart disease than smoking, high cholesterol, hypertension, or even diabetes. So here's the relative risk, high cholesterol, 2.4 times the risk of normal, hypertension 1.6 times, smoking 2, diabetes 2.4, low normal thyroid levels 2.5. Um, let's look at associated between high levels of reverse T3 and mortality after acute myocardial infarction. 
So basically showed that a reverse T3 level associated increased risk for one-year mortality, of, uh, basically by 40% to 600% higher in someone with high reverse T3. Okay, TSH levels and risk of a fatal coronary artery disease. So they broke patients down into groups, a TSH of 0.5 to 1.4, um, a TSH of 1. Point, uh, let's see, sorry, uh, then 1.14 to 2.5, and uh, and then above 2.5 to 3.5. And they found that even within the reference range, significantly increased risk for fatal coronary artery disease as the TSH went up. Again, the TSH is not reliable, but it is reliable if it's high, because you know, again, the pituitary always gets the most thyroid. So if, you're, if your pituitary, if your uh, if your TSH is high, you know you're low thyroid. But if it's normal, you don't know. You got to look at other um, other parameters. Um, let's look at again insulin uh, resistance and diabetes. That if you give a time release T3 preparations, um, uh, you'll basically improve all the uh, insulin resistance, diabetes. But T4 preparations don't work. So it's inappropriate to place obese patients or those with insulin resistance, leptin resistance, or diabetes because you're not addressing the physiologic abnormality. They don't need more T4, they need more T3. Talk about leptin, and I talked about leptin going up, you know, telling the body to st stop storing fat, but in obese individuals there's a leptin resistance. So the, the body, the brain doesn't see the leptin anymore. So the brain thinks the body's starving. It, uh, it, so what it does, it lowers thyroid levels, it basically lowers metabolism, it increases appetite, and tells the body to stop burning fat. Um, so it also suppresses, the leptin resistance will suppress type 1 deiodinase and stimulate type 2. So again, lowering TSH, so if you have high leptin above 12, the TSH is no longer reliable. Um, let's see, study American Journal of uh, Physiology and Endocrine Metabolism that Physiological reversal of leptin resistance, so if you got rid of their leptin resistance, their deiodinase levels uh, went back to normal unless they had high reverse T3. So again, the high reverse T3 really blocks all the, the thyroid effect. So they found that again, a, a reverse T3 above 150 was abnormal. So exercise, more exercise is good, right? Exercise, exercise, exercise. But what they found that in men or women, especially women, who uh, when exercise associated with dieting will significantly reduce the T4, T3 conversion, increase reverse T3, and really counteract those positive effects of weight loss um, in women. Chronic pain suppresses D1, upregulates D2. So you, again, you get low tissue level of uh, thyroid with a normal TSH. Um, okay, what, what if you get rather pain? Give them narcotics. Well, that should potentially improve, but it's shown that the narcotics will also <laughs> suppress type 1 deionase and um, stimulate type 2. So, and there's no tolerance. It just it doesn't go back to normal. So if someone's on pain, on pain medications or in pain, TSH is not reliable. Iron deficiency basically reduces T4, T3 conversion, actually causes a thyroid resistance in a number of different ways as well. More studies showing that. Lowers metabolism, uh, iron deficiencies. You find a lot of iron deficient people are tired and say, well, because you have, you know, you have low iron. Well, it's really their blood cells are fine. They're not anemic. Um, but a lot of it has to do with you're not activating the thyroid. Um, more studies showing there. Oh, I talked a little bit about bioactive TSH. And, and so when the body basically uh, is stressed, um, you know, has inflammation, it will actually secrete a TSH that's less bioactive. And you can see there the bioactivity of normals up there, you know, average 1.6, but if there's secondary or tertiary hypothyroidism, it's below 0.6, and then primary is in between. So it would be great to have this assay to um, be able to quickly determine secondary and tertiary hypothyroidism, nice, um, be able to, you know, show it objectively with an easy blood test, so we're working on that. This is just, I looked at, I took all the data of uh, uh, the, the thyroid level associated with age. And you can see that TSH drops with age. Well, okay, 
That's at the bottom um, chart there. Well, then they're, they're getting a little hyperthyroid. No. They're actually getting hypo. So the free, free T3 is dropping. Their T4 doesn't drop, again, because they have, they have basically abnormal um, transport into the cell. They have reduced T3, uh, T4 conversion. So as you get older, the TSH is not reliable. So we'll talk about transport. Should I leave that for next time? I guess we're running out of time here. So um, we have about, let's see, uh, about with, uh, with transport, a number of different things about diagnosis. And then I guess for the next one, we'll get more into the meat, how to really diagnose it, what alternatives that, that can be used, uh, what preparations. So much more clinical. This one I really want to get into. You know, people say, oh, all you need is TSH. You're crazy to you know, think that it's not reliable. And uh, we'll go more into that, even with thyroid transport, which I think is a major issue that needs to be addressed and, and thought of. But uh, since we ran out of time, and I apologize, um, we'll go ahead and, and take some questions if, if there are any. Um, let's see, questions. Oh, I... Um, I have a problem with my question bar. I can't see the. I can see the quite, but my bar is so tiny that I can't. Um, that's weird. Kent, if it would help, I can uh, read some of them to you. Yeah, all I'm seeing is like a one line, so I can't read the question. Okay. First question we have is: Is synthroid bioidentical to the endogenous T4 found in the body? Yeah, the, the synthroid is bioidentical, but it's T4. So again, the problem is, is really for majority of patients is not that they're not making enough T4, it's that they're not converting, it's not transporting into the cell, and it's shown not to work. When we get into studies on depression, it's interesting, you know, they'll have a low TSH, a high T4, and the studies, oh, they're a little hyperthyroid. No, they have low free T3 and high reverse T3, and, and so doctors will give them T4, and the studies give that, and they say, see, it didn't work, they're not hypothyroid. No, you give them T3 and dramatic improvement. Um, the STAR report, largest study ever done on antidepressants showed that T3 was as good or better than, than the antidepressants that are uh, the way they're typically used with less side effects. Um, nice study, they looked at 160 bipolar patients and they had not responded, treatment resistant patients, not responded to on average of 14 medications, no response. They put them all on T3 regardless of thyroid levels 80% um, responded and 30% had total resolution of symptoms. So, you know, it's kind of like, yeah, T4 is bioidentical, but it's, it's like saying, well, your testosterone level's low, let's give you DHEA or pregnenolone. Yeah, you'll get some conversion, but you need to look at if there's a block, you need to bypass it. We have another question there that asks, why is it important to fast from thyroid meds prior to taking a blood test in order to get a truer test result? Why it's important to not take the thyroid? Is that what you're saying? Yes. And the problem is it doesn't make too much difference if you're on T4. Now, T3 is a problem. You look at cytomel, it's, it's short-acting, it goes high in the blood, and then low. Um, or, you know, time release will be, you know, much more steady. But the problem is, you know, what are normal levels? Normal levels are for the body basically secreting T4, goes into the cell, converts to T3, a little bit comes back out in, in the blood. So that's a normal level. Now, when you give T3, it basically goes high in the blood, then into the cell. So it's a completely different um, level. You're not measuring the same thing. So the problem is someone's on or even armor, they, they take their thyroid, they check the, the blood level, and T3 is very high. And the doctors freak out. They oh, my gosh, but hey, the patient's not hyper. What, what, what's going on? So you really need to set a consistent time. We'll do it 24 hours after with time release T3. Um, you know, it's debatable when you do it, but you got to understand what you're really measuring. Um, and again, blood tests are a piece of information. So you got to, you know, know what you're really trying to look for. Okay. Um, another questioner uh, asks, how do, you, how do you determine the ratio between RT3 and free T3, and what should the appropriate ratio be? That's, 
that's always a big question, and you know, what is the optimal? Now, when you look at all these studies, the problem is, and it's just like with blood tests, you know, with you know, T4, T3, anything, you know, they'll take 95% of the people, and those are considered normal. So in the highest and lowest, two and a half percent are considered abnormal. Now, you look at the studies, a lot of them are done in Europe, and there are different reference ranges, and so there's a lot of conversion. Um, but uh, really, we're finding that a free T3 reverse T3 ratio should be above 2. That's going to be a healthy, optimal level. Or 0.2, it depends on how they do the units. Is it, you know, um, um, you know, free T3 is around, you know, 350. If reverse T3 is um, listed as, you know, 150 to 450, or is it, you know, 0.3, uh, 3.5. Now, people will say, well, you should use T3 because that's the same units as reverse T3. Well, I don't care about the units. The free T3 eliminates some of the variability of T3 in, uh, with binding proteins. So, you know, don't, you know, some of the engineers would call or some doctors that, hey, it's the wrong uh, unit. Don't worry about the units. But that's a general ballpark. Again, it also goes down to optimal. You know, what's an optimal testosterone level, optimal thyroid level versus normal or abnormal. Um, Dr. Holtorf, we have a whole bunch of questions related to Hashimoto's disease. Are you going to address that subject specifically in the, in the next lecture? Well, you know, I, I didn't uh, address much of that. I mean, it's kind of with, with Hashimoto's. Again, I uh, addressed the one study showing that, hey, majority of people with fatigue will have a subclinical Hashimoto's. And if you have Hashimoto's, you know, you need to treat the patient. The studies show that despite normal levels. And it's going to um, reduce the likelihood of progression. Um, and they're low thyroid. They're killing off their thyroid. Now, the problem with Hashimoto's is you also get dumping of the thyroid. As it's killing off the thyroid, it will dump it into the, into the serum. So you're actually getting higher levels, even though it's killing off the thyroid over time. So you get a lot of variability. So you really want to suppress the antibodies. I really like low-dose naltrexone for that. Um, and you'll get a, a significant reduction. Make sure the testosterone level is optimal because you know, men don't get it as much as women because men, you know, high testosterone will suppress autoantibodies. Uh, selenium, uh, journal rheumatology showed 40% reduction in autoantibodies. We use a product called ThyroRx um, from our nutraceutical line that will get significant reduction and also helps thyroid resistance. Um, so, yeah, with Hashimoto's, it shows you that you, you need to treat, but you also want to work on bringing those antibodies down as well. And oftentimes we also find a chronic infection that's driving it. And you look at all these autoimmune diseases, whether it's lupus, MS, um, Hashimoto's, Crohn's, there's usually a chronic infection that's driving it. Their Th2 immune system is too high, their Th1 level is too low, and these um, uh, viruses will actually you know, basically keep um, stimulating the body to um, you know, produce the autoantibody. So uh, normalizing that immune system, getting rid of the infection, lotus naltrexone, gamma globulin can help. Um, even uh, some of the immune boosters, like supplements that boost natural killer cell, people say, why would I do immune booster? It's autoimmune disease. It's too high immunity. No, it's immune dysfunction. So if you increase Th1, you lower the Th2, which is the antibody production of immunity. Okay. I think I'm going to cut you off uh, for, for now, uh, Dr. Holtorf. I want to be respectful of uh, people's time, and I know that many people have took a, taken the time in the middle of their day to listen in. Uh, thank you very much uh, for your presentation. I'd like to remind everybody here that we will be doing a second part uh, so that Dr. Holtorf can cover the rest of his material. It will be scheduled for the 31st of August uh, at the same time, 1.15 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. If you have already registered to receive news and events at the BHI website, you'll get an invitation to join us. If not, uh, I encourage you to go to www.bioidenticalhormoneinitiative.org uh, and sign up to receive news and events. Uh, we plan to have a whole series of interesting and informative webinars that will follow this one up. Again, thank you for those uh, who have attended from all over the country, and Dr. Holtorf, thank you for taking the time uh, to present. Great. Thanks so much.